Buonasera, buonasera a tutti. Benvenuti a questo incontro. E avremo... Good evening, and uh, we're going to have the opportunity to get to know two world famous scientists that have been dealing for many, many years of something that is extremely important and profound of contemporary physics. And um, they have a great passion for fundamental research that have to do with uh, the micro microcosmic level, so what is uh, extremely small, the, so the so-called uh, elementary particles. And their studies are on two different but complementary sides, because on the one hand, as we're going to see, we have uh, the study of the most elusive particles that we know, neutrinos, and on the other hand, 
we have uh, something that uh, has not been defined as a particle yet, but uh, we know it's a fast. It's called dark matter. So we are really getting closer to something that is extremely, I mean, uh, far and close at the same time to us. And our guests study these uh, infinite small realities with different technologies and uh, testing methodologies that are different but complementary. But we would like to do something more. Because uh, apart from getting to know the object of research of our guests, we would like to know more about them, their sort of relation to this reality of the universe, this matter that they study with a great deal of passion. We would like also to get to know more about the person behind uh, the scientist. And I must confess that I'm really extremely glad to have here these two people who are not only colleagues, but they're also two very dear friends. Lucho well has been a friend for so many years uh, and uh, well Willy Jose we have met not so long ago and uh, we met not so long ago but uh, we are very good friends. Uh, Juanjo Jose Gardenas is a professor of physics uh, at the Donostia International Physics Center and as he likes to say well, the possibility and probability to sort of come across him uh, around the world is highest in Canfranc, Geneva, San Sebastian, and Valencia. And he focused on the neutrinos with the uh, NOBAD K2K and T2K experiments and in 2016 among the others he got uh, the breakthrough prize in physics for the results he got on the oscillations of neutrinos and um, he's the leader of the next experiment since 2008 and uh, the goal is to prove that the neutrino is uh, the antiparticle of itself. And Juanjo, on top of that, has also a parallel life as writer. He wrote five uh, novels and uh, several, and he published several articles and books. So a big round of applause for him. And then we have Lucio Rossi, professor at the Department of Physics of the University of Milan. So my direct colleague, well, not since very long time, but he started there and he worked at Milan University, but for 20 years, from 2001 until a few months ago, he worked at uh, CERN in Geneva, where he directed the realization of the superconductor uh, of the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider that uh, discovered uh, Higgs uh, boson and that is still looking for dark matter. So he had a very high level of responsibility at CERN level. On top of that, in 2010, Luce established and directed for 10 years the High Luminosity LSC, so the current most important project of the CERN that will uh, strengthen by 10 times uh, the capacity of the accelerator. Now is going to uh, keep working on his studies on accelerator for mo medical applications. We're going to go back to that for hydrotherapy. 
He got many, many awards and prizes. I just want to mention the most recent one, dating back to 2020, is the European Physical Society Prize. Lucio, as well, works a lot on uh, scientific communication with a special focus on the relation between science and technology, but also talks about the relation between uh, scientific research, certainty, and truth. Thank you very much, Lucio, for being here with us. So we have limited time, so I give them the floor, and I would like to ask them a first question, so maybe the most difficult one. Please let us know what you deal with in your research work in just 10 minutes. So you have to summarize your life of research in 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marco. So. First of all, I do apologize for my poor Italian. I speak like a football player. I learned Italian or something that is similar to Italian by working with the group of uh, Professor Mirko Mazzucato in Padua 30 years ago. So the goal was uh, to make myself understood. So I have a degree in nuclear physics and uh, I used to say that I was uh, a nuclear physicist because neutrinos were totally unknown, but now neutrinos are trendier well, basically, I study elusive particles. The most interesting aspect of these particles is that it is possible that the universe that we know is a reality thanks to the characteristics of these neutrinos, because these neutrinos can be matter and antimatter at the same time. And because of this, they may have played a key role in the primary universe, uh, preventing that primary universe to become a source of uh, a source of energy without any un future. So maybe those neutrinos uh, created some sort of symmetry. The idea of symmetry is very important for physicists because it's something slightly different that changes. They, they, they provoke an asymmetry, sorry. And asymmetries can really change things. And probably that asymmetry was at the origin of the universe as we know it today. So that's what I deal with. Can we see the slides, please? So let's try to be more concrete. What you see here is the neutrinos passage, and uh, you see a beach with many grains of sand, or you can see a set of galaxies and a multitude, and also the neurons of human brains. So my question to you is what these different photographs share? What is the common element? So is uh, something that I'll tell you in a second. The second picture that you see here is a landscape with Comanche. Comanches are Native Americans who were known to 
be able to disappear and hide behind anything. Neutrinos are exactly the same and behave the same because they are evanescent particles. They do not interact with matter and they act like ghosts. Instead, we know that the universe is made of both matter and antimatter because uh, matter and antimatter are symmetrical. We have electrons and protons of matter and antimatter and so on and so forth. So these uh, couple of realities can also encounter and neutralize each other and disappear. At the same time, we know that all the elementary particles of the universe have a, a correspondent antimatter particle, with an exception that is a neutrino. Eta Majorana, a great Italian physicist, made an hypothesis. He said that maybe the neutrino could be the only particle, the only elementary particle that is also its own antiparticle. Why is that so important? Because let's imagine a universe that has uh, the same quantity of matter and the same quantity of antimatter. So the same quantity of angels and demons. So these universe could not exist because if for each particle you have an antiparticle, you have a, a sort of annihilation, a sort of neutralization. So let's imagine that there is a, an asymmetry that is introduced by a neutrino that decides to put a little more matter than antimatter in the primary universe. So if such an asymmetry uh, is real, we can imagine this formula for the universe. And this is very simple. On the left-hand side, there is a particle that can disintegrate either into matter or antimatter. In the middle, you have the asymmetry. So a particle that decides, or maybe it's nature that created this particle, decides uh, to introduce an asymmetry. So maybe a little bit more disintegration with the matter or the antimatter. So what happens then, the whole original uh, universe where there are billions of uh, elementary particles disappears, but there is a little excess and that little excess is the universe as we know it. So it's not so trivial that would explain why we're here. But what I told you is just a theory, is a model, is what uh, theoretical physicists believe. And that there is a way to test it experimentally is what I deal with. I'm not, uh, uh, I mean, uh, especially in theory, I try instead to make tests and experiments uh, to show and prove that the theories are correct. So these experiments aim at uh, a double beta disintegration and they're pretty complicated. On the left hand side, you see something very difficult, looking for a needle in a haystack. But actually that is that easy. It's not a problem, it's banal. What we do is much more difficult. We try to find a grain of sand in a beach, and that's much, much more difficult. So we need very precise and accurate experiments. We need experiments that take a lot of time. The experiments we do can be counted in journeys to Ithaca because Ulysses took 20 years to go to Ithaca. So 
you see this is the first uh, paper model then there's a prototype and uh, the young man that you see here was a student of mine 12 years ago and uh, after 12 years uh, we have uh, this uh, large uh, device and this is the very same young guy so he spent 12 years making experiments and maybe in the next 12 years we will progress furthermore okay that was the last slide so this is uh, in a nutshell what I do I'm going to start. I'm going to show you the slides. Let us have a look at the first one. And let's, uh, well, yes, the first slide. You see the long uh, uh, line of blue pipes, that's the LHHC, that is a big subterranean uh, uh, piece of equipment. Even if it is subterranean, that means that we would like to cast light on uh, the mysteries of the universe. And talking about a uh, piece of equipment, why are tools, why, are, why is equipment so important? Because that's an extension of uh, our own self. How do we meet reality? Actually, uh, the, the tool uh, enables us uh, through the senses to impact reality and the tool is the extension of our senses. So I uh, am proud to say that I am basically the one who continues the tradition of Galileo who uh, actually works a lot with tools, with equipment. So producing uh, an instrument is a technical act but it is first and foremost a cultural act. A tool, a piece of equipment is actually the reaction to reality and enables the self to grow by impacting on reality. Let's move on to the second slide. What the tools I produce are accelerators, particle accelerators who are used, uh, whom, uh, which we use to see what's uh, infinitely small. And that's a fundamental relation, what you see there, for quantum mechanics. Accelerators are light generators. We can see things to the light of quantum mechanics, uh, thanks to the equation you see on the slide. Uh, so I'm not going too much into technical details, but what you see there is helpful because that enables us to see uh, very, uh, very, very small particles. These are the nano-nanotechnologies. Uh, we are now navigating into the so-called Dixentom space. So next slide. This shows that in order for us to produce this equipment, uh, which has become very, very long, LHCs are about 27 kilometers. And so to do that, we need to uh, be together. So in order to face reality, to touch reality, the self, the I, needs to become a we. And that is why uh, we uh, join forces at CERN. There are about 12 European states, 23 member states. They used to be 20, 12 European states. Now they are 20, uh, 23 member states. And this we do to produce uh, equipment that uh, enable us to uh, meet reality. In particular, what I deal with is uh, super conducive uh, magnets, uh, the LHC technology. This is a wonderful phenomenon. Um, what I would like to show is that it's never enough to meet reality, but you need to have the subject capable of knowing reality, of understanding reality. And the first thing to do is to open your eyes. So the LHC generates lights, but then this light is is actually seen uh, thanks to four big four eyes, which are the four eyes of the LHC. But then 
the eyes are not enough, you need the subject. And the subject is the actually the brain of the 10,000 physicists who carried out an analysis of this. This is something that is always amazing to me. I mean, you, you start from the tool, you start from the equipment, but then from that you reach the I, the self. This slide shows what this tool uh, does. It generates this light generated by collisions of light. And as a matter of fact, we talk about luminosity. Uh, for example, in the Atlas experiment that you see here, we have been able to, in a way, uh, have an expansion to see what you uh, what happens in the macro generator, in the Atlas macro generator. If it is expanded, you see this light. You do not see it directly. The Higgs boson lives uh, by one million, one billionth, uh, of one billionth of one billionth of second. So there's no way to say it directly, but that's a, a truly indirect knowledge. So we see indirectly, but that doesn't mean that we reach certainty. We only use very precise tools. We've now found the Higgs boson. And actually, we talked about that a couple of years ago with Professor Bertolucci. And this is something that really very much striking. The more we know, uh, the more questions are raised, the more capable we are of replying to our questions, uh, and uh, the more questions are raised. And this is something that really strikes me. In other words, uh, scientific knowledge is inexorable, and that uh, happens uh, exactly with uh, uh, the same in the same way with people you never stop getting to know a person into detail and the same happens with reality we've discovered the Higgs boson but we're not finished yet the Higgs boson which is so fundamental explains only 5% of the uh, content of matter and energy of the uniform and actually the rest uh, means that we are called upon to produce more robust, more solid equipment to be able to see uh, what's left. So we worked on the high luminosity LHC project, means uh, meaning more light to see better. To do that, again, we need to progress. We need to produce more technology in a virtuous circle in which knowledge uh, has uh, to go hand in hand with technology, and technology enables uh, knowledge. So this is a virtuous circle, and the West uh, uh, has actually been the first area in the world to investigate into this. Probably we were not the first to do that. Probably the Chinese came first in other areas. However, thanks to the promotion of knowledge, then technology itself uh, um, has been accelerated enormously. This technology, exactly like the one of the high luminosity, luminosity LHC, is then used this is to show you that there is a whole project. We started with the LEP in the 1980s, the high luminosity uh, LHC. But thanks to this high luminosity project, we are already uh, thinking about the future project, which is the FCC project. This project uh, will lead us uh, up until the beginning of 2040, 2050. Uh, of course, we're talking about very long timing. Those who start a project will probably not see the end of the same project. Probably I started this project, but won't be able to see the end. And the same uh, applies with the LHC. That means that there are several researchers passing on the baton one from one to the other. Um, so coming back to Milan, I deal with medical appliances, I deal in the health sector, uh, and I deal with tools for particle physics. What's incredible in this equipment is that the focus is always on the I, on the self, which is true because all of us want to be successful. That's true. This is one of the triggers. However, in order to be truly successful, the I needs to be motivated. It needs to find the motivation to become an us because if you build a tool, is ultimately an us made up of many individual selves, of many individual eyes. That means that uh, you need to have the creativity of the scientist, but if this creativity is put to the common good, to the use of the common goods, then you can find and meet new bits of reality. This is actually what the tool that I am dealing with actually does. Allora, sì, 
pensa spesso che one is often uh, led to think that science um, has some kind of an automatic progression that there is no relation with the subject that lies behind science however i think that uh, judging from the passion with which you told uh, you talked about your work one can really understand that this is not the case your work is uh, very much rests uh, on humanity so my question to you is the following what's the effect uh, that uh, is generated when you think about the effect of your research? What's the fascination? What's the admiration that one can feel or perceive in the relation with that universe, which is so fascinating, but at the same time so mysterious, which is very much present and so much elusive? You already said everything. When you start studying the universe, so when you become, uh, as a young researcher, a specialist in uh, such particles, well, at the beginning, you want to solve problems. Uh, so that's your horizon. You just want to fix problems, one after the other. And then at one point, you start asking yourself questions like, for instance, how is it possible that the universe that we study is at the same time so comprehensible and ordered because there are so many laws uh, that uh, let us uh, write the history of the universe since the Big Bang until now. But how is it possible that in spite of all these certainty and this deep comprehension of the universe, we still don't have a clue about so many things? Because 5% of the universe, well, is a part of the visible universe, but we have no idea about what the dark matter is. Nobody ever heard about 20, 30 years ago about the, the, the dark matter until 20, 30 years ago. So the universe is always able to surprise you. So the, uni the universe is comprehensible and mysterious at the same time. This uh, uh, situation somehow gives me a sense of transcendence. I think that my job is extremely fascinating and interesting because we really try to put some order where there is there seems to be none. So trying to also accept the idea that uh, we never delve enough into the mystery. That's my relationship with the reality I deal with every day. Okay, I just link up to something Wanko said, this ability to be surprised. Uh, when I, I am a, a little bit older than him, and when I started, neutrinos had no mass. But then when Mersanelli started to work in astronomy, he didn't know that the universe could implode. So with dark matters, it's opening up. So we go on, we go forward, and it seems to be never-ending. At the beginning, I was really fascinated by what is new. Well, now maybe the thing that strikes me the most and that somehow concerns me a bit is this uh, sort of uh, endless characteristic. What is the sign of? This is the endless nature of knowledge. And if I think about my children, I realized that there is an incredible symmetry between the 
world with the soul and the soulless world. Because when you get to know somebody you know, you never get to the end. The more you love somebody, the more that person is enriched and hard to be known. So again, this is endless nature of things uh, is uh, scary and interesting because uh, we know that uh, every limit is always pushed forward. So each limit is there, not just to be overcome, but really to be pushed forward. And this is like a constant concern because I then ask myself, what is uh, all about? Uh, why do we start experiments that can last also 20, 30, 40 years? Well, first of all, to get an income, it's clear, but why? Why should we work so hard for such experiments that last so long? So it seems to be something difficult to be done. And as a matter of fact, sometimes it gets hard. And I wonder how some colleagues can really somehow sustain such a burden. I remember that years ago, I mean, so little was known. But now we found much more, but we still keep ourselves questions. Knowing that everything is precarious is not encouraging. But why do we go on? Because we're attracted to order, to beauty. But all this is done for a purpose, to let us reflect. This is thought to make ourselves more aware in order to have the eye more aware. But this mechanism, in my opinion, is uh, something absolutely interesting because uh, I feel responsible for having the duty to find out more about these uh, apparently unexplicable realities. But all that uh, seems to have been designed for a purpose and specifically to not let me rest, so to encourage me always to, to find more and study more, to keep finding answers. Another thing that I would like to ask you is the following. So your first words already gave us an idea of who you are and what you do. But I know that doing this job means now more than ever to collaborate with a very high number of people. We also know that a large part of our job has to do with relations to the others. And when it comes to the collaboration with the thousands of people for projects that last uh, 10 years or so, it's a lifetime. It's not even the building of a cathedral or a journey to Ithaca. So this is something that can really be measured in a lifetime. So fundamental research is facing such a situation. In your experience and according to your opinion, how is it possible to highlight each individual's contribution? Because as Lucio said, there are people and subjects, and I'm thinking about the young people who would like to start a job in this sector. So, for instance, that young guy that has been working for more than 10 years on the same experiment, I would really like to know from you your experience in this respect. This is a very interesting question. 
There is a very famous French adage, Lac Soumia, La Cire Vous. So I am the art uh, and uh, we are science. In other words, uh, this is how you make science. You make science, you do science uh, with groups of people. Otherwise, you, you, you won't do it. And I believe that if you want to achieve first quality science, you need to, first of all, uh, have a group. And this group has to have faith. So the attention towards the fact that you're entering a very dangerous realm. And when I say faith, I am saying that actually nobody is going to, in a way, compromise their own life or 20 years of their life uh, unless you feel that what you are doing is useful and is meaningful, that it can contribute somehow to something greater than uh, the self. This is something that we very rarely or probably never phrase, rephrase this way. I do not know of any good quality scientist who is not uh, uh, faithful towards science. So faith is important. And if you have this uh, faith, then the meaning of your search, then it is possible to work in a team because the team has uh, something in common. There is a shared value and everything becomes uh, 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 fascinating. At our times, in our times, it's very difficult to do science uh, because uh, the questions posed by young people are very, very different from what I'm saying. I mean, young people have to have a career. They want to have a career. They want to earn academic posts. They have to publish. Uh, and all of these are actually questions posed uh, on the eye. You have to be nicer, faster, quicker, and smarter. But if you don't work together, you uh, you won't work in any way. And I think this is one of the biggest problems that uh, uh, modern science, be it, for example, science on uh, uh, a particle accelerator or on other areas, uh, has to pose itself. How is it possible to work together? Because if you don't work together, you won't proceed. You cannot uh, uh, progress by simply certifying the individual scientist. As happened in the past, uh, uh, when, I mean, you had ancient navigators and back then you had the meaning of the group who has to look for something. But actually there must be something common that the groups believes in. And this common belief is actually faith towards the universe. If we do not reinforce it, then in the end, eventually we won't make it. I would also like to comment on this. I think we have exactly this problem. Everybody would like to succeed. Everybody wishes to be important. And yet, to do this, as Swanko said, you need to join forces. Actually, if you do research today, you normally have a group. Of course, there's always room for an individual, but especially in the field of experimental or instrumental uh, phys physics, it is large teams that progress. So how can we make sure that there is no uh, difference, no antinomy between actually doing research as an individual or doing research as a team? Of course, everything starts from a leader. If you're capable of saying I, that means that you have to recognize that also the other uh, can uh, has the right to say I. So the I expresses itself when it recognizes that there is another self, that there is another I. And this dynamics is particularly important in, in science. Otherwise, uh, because this is actually the only way we have to have uh, to become leader and to work on a 20-year-long project that becomes truly sustainable. Otherwise, uh, everything ends up being exploiting the other, and everybody only wants to find its own. Uh, 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 advantage in the long term this is just this is only but uh, um, a waste of resources and uh, not uh, opposing the I to the um, us uh, 
is something needed because it is also professionally convenient. And this is something that I understood when we had the major accident of the LHC in, 20, in 2008. As soon as it started, some time later, there was an accident and we were stopped for a year. And this raised a number of issues on the uh, functioning of the machine. Of course, the accident, uh, it then emerged that the accident was in the magnetic part of the equipment. Uh, and I realized that at the beginning, everybody was kind of blocked. So I wondered why. Probably because actually what they didn't want to have, they didn't want to be blamed for the, for the accident. And so I was the leader and I took uh, the blame upon me. By doing this, I became credible and I highlighted the fact that I was understanding the problem of the arrows. And in doing so, I was releasing energy. The I became an us and the error was an opportunity to make the accelerator even more robust than when we did it. So an I that recognizes the others, an I that becomes a us, a we, I believe does something extraordinary. It shows that error which is basically intrinsic, inborn in anything we make, everybody has made mistakes. So the mistake, mistakes become uh, an opportunity to uh, progress. And this is something that I learned and I, this is what actually I tried to do in educating my children. Uh, it's not true that you don't have to make mistakes, but you have to be able to look at the mistake, you have to embrace the mistake and see it as an opportunity to go forward. This is something that you can see in the dynamics of groups. If groups are kind of terrorized by their liberal leaders because they think that they cannot make mistakes, then they produce much less. But if you have a group that uh, um, accepts mistakes and everybody becomes free and the I becomes uh, uh, really a sharing of experience and then you are able, you are capable of building cathedrals, in our case, our particle accelerators. I have one last question to you. Sometimes it seems that this kind of research is interesting, but sometimes a bit useless, as if it were completely disconnected from everybody's life. To a certain extent, this is also true. It is very far away from the life of ordinary, of most ordinary people. Please tell us something about the usefulness of the work you do. And specifically in your case, please tell us if uh, you have examples of possible applications of what uh, are the technological um, results of fundamental research that can be projected into everybody's life. Well, actually, here we've talked a lot about cathedrals. I like the idea of cathedrals very much. Cathedrals were perfect examples of labors, uh, great, big things, but also useless. Actually, cathedrals uh, were uh, actually useless. The only usefulness they had was the fact that a thousand years later they would be there uh, to tell uh, uh, us probably the uh, human race could be forgiven simply for the fact that they had built cathedrals. So we need to, to mm, beware towards these useless uh, things. For example, uh, if you have a scientist working with a strange piece of equipment, actually, if you look at this scientist, actually that science is simply playing. Maybe he can uh, look at his hand and see actually the, uh, uh, the bones of that hand, and that would eventually lead to the discovery of x-rays. So in other cases, we managed to save a large quantity of bits. So a basic research naturally leads to experiments that are useful for everybody. In our case, we 
actually do experiments to actually search whether to investigate whether neutrinos uh, has an antiparticle that is indeed useless. But actually working on this together with one of my collaborators with Paolo, we understood that the same technology uh, could be used to produce a PET uh, scanner, which is a medical scanner that can help identify, uh, for example, areas of metabolic activity, especially a cancer. And so we uh, received European resources and our group together, our group is now putting a lot of effort to investigate this technology even further because in a couple of years this technology will be used. For example, to, at the moment, this technology cannot be applied to children because the quantity of radioactivity that they can absorb is too large. However, thanks to the technology we are proposing, which includes neutrinos, well, then might be that in some years this technology can be applied to children as well uh, in, in a much uh, cheaper and more effective way. So basic research intrinsically le and automatically leads uh, to these advances. And I believe that this is something that Fabiola Giannotti often likes to say. There are two main ways of seeing science. One is to think that we're spending time by simply, by simply being more precise in creating more and more uh, um, pieces of equipment. And the other time is actually electricity. Electricity comes always from basic research. And this is something that we tried to contribute to. I would like to cover two main aspects. First of all, I'd like to talk about methodology. One of the most interesting things of scientific research, and I think that even the industrial sector is now looking at this, is the fact that a very large part of the collaborations in this field work with a relatively little organizational structure. And that is because people have a shared objective, and the method is correct. And actually, the fundamental method of scientific research is to follow, because that's basically the method that all human beings adopt. How can you learn from Professor Cadena and Wanko? Actually, you follow them. You be, you are, you have them. Uh, you are, you actually work with them, uh, and then after a number of years, you become uh, equally good. Following uh, is actually does not mean the elimination of the self, but rather the flourishing of the self. Of course, if you are smart in doing that, from a practical viewpoint, um, like I said at the beginning, now I'm going back to Milan, and I am now dealing with the medical physics uh, applications. Hugo Maldi, my master, actually talked about the beautiful physics, uh, for example. Uh, you have the beautiful physics, like, for example, the Higgs boson, and the useful physics, for example, that kind of physics applied to the medical sector. In my specific case, there are two of the big eyes of modern medicine, so the PET scan and magnetic resonance imaging, which derive from research activities on uh, accelerators. Uh, so basically, if you do magnetic resonance, you uh, actually uh, are dealing with something which are less powerful, but very similar to an LHC. And then in Milan, I'm currently working also on the hadron therapy, so the direct use of particles, of accelerated particles. So small accelerators means uh, uh, it doesn't mean 27 kilometers, but uh, it still means 200 meters to uh, treat uh, some uh, radio-resistant uh, 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 forms of tumors. So I am counseled by the fact that there is no antinomy between basic research and applied research. Both are mutually supportive because applied research also helps you develop new tools that are needed for basic uh, research. So tout uh, tient, you have uh, uh, just one common good, but you can see it from many different uh, points of view and facets.
may the reader. So it would be wonderful to be able to continue this dialogue, but we will continue that because tomorrow at uh, four o'clock in the afternoon in the scientific area curated by Eresis and Scientific Campus, uh, Juan Jose Elucho will be available to continue this conversation. I have the impression that today we had the privilege to appreciate uh, beauty under two different aspects. On the one hand, the natural aspect of an object, of the object that they study, so the infinitely small, so and with the accuracy that is required to study such a small particle like a neutrino that could make the difference in the universe by itself, well, that makes your heart dizzy. And the other dimension of beauty that we experienced is that of a of a human journey because we got to know two men for whom research is part of a much broader horizon. So humanly it is credible, it is fascinating. There is a real and authentic research work on the subject, on the connection between the physical world and the whole human horizon that always tries to aspire to something big. The things we have been talking about can be applied to any one of us, regardless of the specificities of our lives. For instance, when Lucho said to what extent the mistake, the failure everybody is afraid of, if uh, considered with reason, common sense, and uh, intelligence, can become a resource. I was struck also by Juanco when he talked about the faith considered in a secular way as a necessary tool for knowledge and even to get to know neutrinos. So that's why I think that this conversation was really enriching and because it gave us an example how big and small at the same time is this human eye that is this year's theme at the meeting. So this eye is opposed to something so big and endless that is the universe, but at the same time we are grateful for an eye that was given to us, and we are always amazed and surprised by what is in front of us. So thank you very much once again. We want to thank the meeting of Rimini that let us meet uh, people like these two ones. So thank you to the meeting of Rimini for creating these authentic, intense encounters. The meeting exists and can exist uh, and will be able to exist uh, thanks to donations. Donations are a fundamental and easy gesture for keeping the meeting alive. There are some specific desks where you can donate with the heart as a symbol, and we are all invited to join and generously donate. Thank you very much again, and uh, goodbye.